Thank you for joining me today for our whistleblowing webinar. My name is Kate Walsh and I'm a solicitor within Clark's Legal's employment team based in Reading. I'm currently on to comment to a large construction and facilities management client. So on to today's session, whistleblowing pitfalls for the unwary. It's a good time to have an update on whistleblowing following the various legislative and case law developments which have taken place. I hope to give you an overview today of all these changes but we will particularly be focusing on, firstly, origins, what's the purpose behind whistleblowing legislation, why watch out for whistleblowers and what particular risks do they pose, what amounts to a protected disclosure, and we'll have a quick run through the recent developments on this issue, an update on case law and agency workers and um, following two very interesting cases this year, and lastly, managing whistleblowing in the workplace tips and tricks. So to begin with, um, origins, it's useful to have an understanding of why the law protects whistleblowers. And it's largely because of the series of disasters and financial scandals which took place in the 1980s and 90s, and the numerous inquiries which revealed that workers felt too scared to speak about wrongdoing in the workplace for fear of personal reprisal. This is obviously the positive side of whistleblowing, and we'll come on to policies a little later on, because a well-drafted policy should encourage whistleblowing in the workplace so employers can investigate and deal with any concerns internally. Although the legislation has started out with good intentions, it has been somewhat manipulated by some workers in certain cases, and unwary employers may be caught out. So why watch out for whistleblowers? Those of you who maybe have not had experience of whistleblowing in the workplace or have only dealt with one or two complaints which did not uh, lead anywhere may be wondering why there is a particular fear of whistleblowers. In my view, there are three main reasons. The first being that compensation in successful whistleblower claims is uncapped. So in ordinary unfair dismissal claims, a cap applies to the compensatory award if the claimant is successful. The current cap is the lower of either a year's salary or £78,962, but this cap does not apply in successful whistleblowing dismissal claims. The latest statistics we have on average whistleblowing compensation dates back to 2010, and the Public Concern at Work, um, a whistleblowing charity, reported that the highest award made in a whistleblowing case was £3.4 million. The lowest was 1000 and the average was £113,667. And a further example of an employee attracting a particularly large award is the case of Watkinson against Royal Cornwall Hospital's NHS Trust. And Mr Watkinson was a chief executive at the Trust, and he voiced concern over proposals to move cancer services out of Cornwall to Devon. He was dismissed for a breakdown in trust and confidence. Both the Tribunal and the Employment Appeal Tribunal held that Mr Watkinson was dismissed for making a protected disclosure. And due to the stigma and adverse publicity surrounding his dismissal, the Tribunal found that Mr Watkinson was unlikely to ever find new employment within the NHS. So it awarded him a total of over 1.2 million, over half a million of which was for future loss of earnings up until the date he would reach the age of 63, which is the age the Tribunal found that he was likely to have have retired. So leaving compensation aside, the second and potentially most important reason to businesses is the reputational damage that can be caused by a lost whistleblowing case. Tribunal hearings are public hearings and a lost case may be reported in the press or the judgment may be made available online. And if you are part of an organisation that has to tender for future work, a lost whistleblowing case can also act as a bar to tender. And the final reason why whistleblowing cases can lead to sleepless nights is that they usually involve very lengthy proceedings. Tribunals are usually very reluctant to strike out whistleblowing claims at preliminary hearings. So if you are unfortunate enough to find yourself defending a whistleblowing claim, it's likely that you'll have to endure several preliminary hearings together with a lengthy final hearing. And final hearings of more than five days in length are not uncommon important to bear in mind the legal costs and the management time that would have to go into these hearings, which is why the majority of whistleblowing claims are usually settled. So moving away from the risks attached to whistleblowing claims and focusing on how to minimise exposure to such claims, it's important to know what protected disclosures look like so you can deal with them appropriately. So let's look at qualifying disclosures. 
The first point to be aware of is that whistleblowing claims can be brought by both employees and workers. So workers, the definition under the Employment Rights Act is workers that may be working under a contract of employment or a contract for personal service. But this definition does not extend as far as genuinely self-employed contractors. When the worker makes a disclosure, he or she must have a reasonable belief that one or more of the following has occurred, is occurring, or is likely to occur. And as you can see on the slide, that's a criminal offence, a breach of a legal obligation, a miscarriage of justice, danger to the health and safety of any individual, damage to the environment, or deliberate concealment of any of the above. But the key point to remember is that the employee or the worker must have a reasonable belief in one or more of these failures. So let's have a look at a few pitfalls which employers regularly fall down on when looking at um, qualifying disclosures. One common pitfall relates to reasonable belief. It does not matter if the belief turns out to be wrong. The fact that the leading case on this point involved a lecturer being told by his students that his predecessor discussed terrorist activities with the students and said that he wanted a terrorist attack to take place in London. Understandably, the lecturer was concerned and went on to notify the CIA, the FBI and British police. He then claimed to suffer detrimental treatment by the college as a result of making these disclosures. The tribunal found that it did not matter that his disclosures turned out to be false. The lecturer still had a reasonable belief, even if it was a mistaken belief. And the second point, the disclosure must convey facts. The, the disclosure will still be protected even if the facts are already known to the recipient. And that's a common pitfall that employers usually fall down on. And remember that disclosures can be verbal, writing, or a recording. One of the last trickier points is that there must be a disclosure of information rather than an allegation or statement of opinion. But be careful. An allegation can constitute or include information. And so let's have a look at an example. So meet Richard. Richard is a nurse, and he is concerned about health and safety risks at his hospital. On Monday, he says to his supervisor, this place is an accident waiting to happen. The following day, he tells his supervisor, the wards have not been cleaned for weeks. I have found three sharks left lying around today. Which of these do you think is likely to constitute a qualifying disclosure? Or do you think they're both? So can you see that what Richard said on Monday was an expression of opinion? It did not contain any facts, whereas his disclosure on Tuesday conveyed facts. One being that the wards had not been cleaned for weeks, and two, that sharks had been left lying around. His Tuesday disclosure is very likely to amount to a qualifying disclosure, and provides all the other requirements that have been met, and we'll discuss these later on, they might be converted into a protected disclosure. It's important that your organisation is aware of these nuances, because what you do not want to happen is someone being overly dismissive of someone's complaint, because they do not feel it's a valid disclosure. You may inadvertently then go on to subject them to detrimental treatment without realizing that the worker is protected against such treatment. So to recap, we have discussed two out of four of the requirements so far for a qualifying disclosure, being that the disclosure of information must demonstrate that the employee or worker has a reasonable belief one or more of the relevant failures has occurred, is occurring, or is likely to occur. The third requirement is that for all disclosures made after June 2013, the worker must have a reasonable belief that the disclosures are made in the public interest. The reason for this amendment is due to concerns that workers were relying on breaches of their individual employment contract to bring a whistleblowing claim and were succeeding. The case law, unfortunately, on this point since the amendments have come in are in a bit of disarray. There are three cases since the changes came in which we can draw some guidance from. And you can see the names of these cases on the slide. And the first is Chesterton Global. In Chesterton, the employee's disclosure was based on an assertion that the company was deliberately supplying inaccurate profit and loss figures to its accountants, which overstated actual costs and liabilities incurred, resulting in lower commission payments for around 100 senior managers at Chesterton's which of course included himself. This in turn made the company appear more profitable to the benefit of its shareholders. The tribunal concluded that it was the claimant's reasonable belief that the disclosures were in the interest of 100 senior managers and that it was a sufficient group of the public to amount to being a matter in the public interest. 
This was the case even though the claimant was mostly motivated by concern of his own income. Chesterton appealed this decision to the Employment Appeal Tribunal. The Employment Appeal Tribunal held that the public interest requirement was satisfied. Permission had been granted for this case to be appealed to the Court of Appeal, so we are awaiting the hearing date for this. Another case dealing with this issue is Underwood against Wincanton PLC. And in that case, um, it concerns an unfair distribution of overtime and whether that could be in the public interest. The employment judge held that it, was, it could be in the uh, public interest and the employment judge at first instance was wrong to strike it out. The last case that we have on this slide is Morgan against Royal Men Cap Society. The claimant in this case made a disclosure about cramped working conditions. At first instance, the tribunal struck the claim out and said that it was not in the public interest. The claimants appealed to the Employment Appeal Tribunal. The EAT held the tribunal was wrong to strike the claim out. The tribunal had failed to take the facts at their highest. While the employee's disclosures were about her own predicament and the fact that she had an earlier injury that made her working conditions dangerous in her view, she also asserted the belief that others might be affected by the working conditions and that assertion was not tested by evidence and should have been accepted. So where did this leave us? The predictions are that we may see that there's room for individuals to complain about their individual contract if it affects a wider subsection of the public, or we may see a, a range of reasonable responses tests, and the tribunals will be testing claimants as to whether their belief fell into a range of reasonable responses, similar to the test that we've got under unfair dismissal. But ultimately, the best chance that we have is to wait the guidance which will hopefully be offered in the Chesterton decision. But until then, employers must proceed with caution because the public interest test may be significantly diluted. On to protected disclosures. So qualifying disclosures are converted into protected disclosures if they are made to the right people. As you can see from the slide, more stringent conditions are attached when workers seek to disclose outside of the organisation. We don't have enough time today to go through these conditions attached to making um, these certain disclosures, but it's obviously important that your policies encourage workers to disclose to you as the employer in the first place, so you have the chance to investigate concerns and you can maintain control of the matter. So if a worker can get past each of the hurdles that we've already discussed, they may bring a claim for automatic unfair dismissal if they are an employee. And remember, there's no requirement in whistleblowing claims for employees to have two years' service, as is the case with ordinary unfair dismissal claims. Employees may also claim that they have suffered detrimental treatment short of dismissal because they're a whistleblower. If the individual is a worker rather than an employee, workers cannot bring unfair dismissal claims, but they can bring unfair detriment claims. A further amendment and that was brought about by the Enterprise and Regulatory Reform Act is that employers may now be um, vicariously liable for the detrimental acts of fellow workers or agents. Such acts are to be treated as also done by the employer, and it is irrelevant whether this is done with the knowledge or approval of the employer. In order for an agent of an employer to be personally liable for subjecting a worker to a detriment, he or she must have acted with the employer's authority. So there is some scope to argue, if you're an employer, that the agent was acting without authority or beyond it, but Agency arguments fall outside the scope of this webinar. So looking at fellow workers and the acts of fellow workers and whether an employer um, may be vicariously liable, the employer will still have a defence if they can show that they took all reasonable steps to prevent the co-worker from doing the detrimental act. The burden is on the employer to show that all reasonable steps have been taken to prevent detriment occurring prior to the act complained of and there were no further reasonable steps it could have taken. In assessing whether all reasonable steps had been taken, a tribunal will look to see, one, whether the employer had a whistleblowing policy in place, two, whether the policy adequately deals with the issue of that victimization of whistleblowers, whether the workforce was aware that such conduct was prohibited, and whether the employer dealt with any complaints effectively and promptly. So you can see the importance of policies and training is key here. And it's important to note that as a result of these changes, employees can be personally liable for any detriment claims and may be joined to proceedings alongside the employer. So now let's have a look at the position um, regarding agency workers. 
So as mentioned earlier, whistleblowing claims may be brought by both employees and workers. The Employment Rights Act 1996 contains an extended definition of workers under Section 43K to ensure certain individuals are protected under the legislation. So you'll see that this provision extends protection to home workers, freelancers, certain NHS practitioners, student nurses and agency workers because it was felt that these categories of individuals should benefit from protection. The section on your slide relates to agency workers. And the problem with agency workers and whistleblowing is that most commonly uh, workers only have a contract with the agency and not the end user or the business with whom they are placed. So what happens when an end user or, or the business subjects the agency worker to detrimental treatment as a result of them being a whistleblower? Can the worker bring a claim against the end user? The answer lies within the definition in the section 43K, which is on your slide. And agency workers may bring a claim against an end user if they can show, one, that they were introduced or supplied to do that work by a third person, which is usually satisfied in, in, a, in agency scenarios. But secondly, the more difficult requirement is that the agency worker must show that the terms are substantially determined, not by the worker himself, by, but by the person for whom he works, the third person, or by both of them. And we'll take a closer look at this issue, um, which came up in two cases involving healthcare practitioners. And so the first case um, was Day against Lewisham and Greenwich NHS Trust, and the later case was McTeague against University Hospital Bristol NHS Foundation Trust. So we'll have a look at Dr. Day first. So Dr. Day was employed by the NHS Trust, but was on a training placement with the Health Education England. So Dr. Day was a junior doctor. Dr. Day lodged a complaint about serious understaffing at one of the hospitals he attended during his training. But both at First Instance Tribunal and the Employment Appeal Tribunal, they both held that Dr. Day was not a worker for Section 43K purposes. Why? The tribunal found that um, HEE, so the, the Health Education England, did not substantially determine Dr. Day's terms. Despite HEE deciding where he was to work, monitoring his progress, and paying the trust a substantial proportion of his salary, but the EAT held that substantially meant in large part and rejected any argument that it meant more than trivially. The tribunal and the EAC also found that the HEE did not introduce Dr. Day or supply him. I understand Dr. Day is seeking permission for leave to appeal. The next case, which is, provides a contrasting decision, is in McTeague case. And Miss McTeague was employed by an agency called TASCOR. She was supplied to the trust and was given a standard form contract by the trust. The trust told her who her supervisor was informed her of absence notification procedures and told her that she was required to cooperate with the trust in relation to health and safety issues, clinical governance and working time. The contract also reserved the trust right to terminate. Task or dealt with any disciplinary and grievance procedures and also Miss McTeague's remuneration. At first instance, the tribunal held that they did not have jurisdiction to hear Miss McTeague's claim that she was not a worker under um, the, the broader definition of worker under the Employment Rights Act, or a worker under Section 43K, which is the section you've seen previously on the slide. The judge held that the trust would have had to determine the majority of terms, or at least the significant ones, for Miss McTeague to amount to a worker. Miss McTeague appealed to the Employment Appeal Tribunal, and the EAT held that once it's established that an individual has been supplied by an agency to work for another person, must then consider who has determined the terms of engagement. It is possible that the agency and the end user could be the employer for these purposes if they both substantially determine the terms. It is not necessary to consider who determined the majority of the terms or the most significant. If both parties have between them determined the relevant terms but have done so to different extents, both parties might have substantially determined the terms. So where does this leave us? Um, it's a question of fact who substantially determined the terms. So in Dr. Day's case, the training provider did not, 
and which is why he was unable to bring a claim. But for Miss McTeague, it was found that both the agency and the end user could have substantially determined her terms. So this clarifies for us that there may be two employers for these purposes. And why is that important for you? But it's important that your policies extend to agency workers and that staff are aware that if the whistleblowing legislation can cover agency workers too. Um, but the importance of um, making sure your policies capture this point neatly brings me on to my next slide and the importance of policy. So we'll start to look at tips and tricks and managing whistleblowing in the workplace. So the importance of policies and promoting them. Please do not underestimate the importance of a well-drafted policy, not only for creating a culture where workers feel encouraged to report concerns to you first rather than running off to the press, but for staff to understand how to respond to a disclosure. Also, and very importantly, we mentioned this earlier in relation to vicarious liability. Your policies will be scrutinized if you're unfortunate enough to find yourself defending a whistleblowing claim. And in vicarious liability cases, the tribunal will be looking at whether you've taken all reasonable steps to prevent whistleblowing victimization in the workplace by colleagues or agents. And to help you uphold your whistleblowing policy, it's useful to appoint a whistleblowing officer. And, and this should be someone who workers feel comfortable to disclose any concerns to. And someone who will receive training on how to deal with disclosures and understand the company's policies. This should hopefully encourage workers to disclose early, as we mentioned earlier. On to the next tips and tricks. So first point is to investigate disclosures thoroughly because you'll want to avoid any inference at a tribunal that you ignored the whistleblower's concerns and perhaps branded him as a bit of a troublemaker. This will obviously not give a great impression to the tribunal. You would prefer to show that you took the worker's disclosures seriously, investigated and kept him informed throughout. And the last point on the slide, as you can see, for, for data protection reasons, you should seek the worker's consent before disclosing the subject of his or her disclosure to the whistleblowing team to investigate. On to the next slide, another common pitfall for the unwary um, is taking action against a whistleblower for a separate reason. So let's go back to our old friend Richard, the nurse, who complains about um, sharp lying around on the floor and, and the hospital not being cleaned. So he's made his disclosure, but say whilst you're investigating um, that particular disclosure, you find out that Richard may have been fraudulent with his expenses claims. When investigating that misconduct, you'll need a clear paper trail to demonstrate that Richard's disclosure about health and safety concerns and the cleanliness of the, uh, the hospital was treated entirely separate to Richard's potential misconduct to demonstrate that decision-making is completely unconnected. You also want to avoid PAC mentality decisions, um, particularly following the case um, this year, which is Royal Mail against Duty. The dismissal in this case was held to be automatically unfair, despite the decision-maker or the disciplinary officer not being aware of the disclosure. So in this case, the claimant made a protected disclosure and following which the tribunal found that her supervisor had set her an ever-changing, unattainable list of requirements. She was eventually performance managed and dismissed for uh, poor performance by an individual who did not have any knowledge of her disclosure. At first instance, the tribunal found that the dismissing manager must have knowledge of the disclosure for it to influence the decision to dismiss. The claimant appealed. At the Employment Appeal Tribunal, it held that even if a decision is made by an individual who does not have all of the relevant facts, or perhaps who is being manipulated by someone else who has been motivated by protected disclosures, then the unlawful motive can be attributed to the employer. So in other words, the ignorance of the individual decision maker about the employee's protected disclosure will not be enough for the employer to avoid liability. And on to the last Two tips and tricks for avoiding common pitfalls. Be careful because grievances may be disguised as protective disclosures. So make sure that your business is aware of this so they're not overly dismissive of grievances. And lastly, do not think you're out of the woods just because a whistleblower has left your organization. Take care when providing references because ex-employees and workers 
may still bring detriment claims should you provide a damaging reference because they were a whistleblower. So that concludes our webinar. Thank you for listening. Um, we now have a few minutes to discuss some questions that have come in during the webinar. Um, I'm joined by my colleague Jeff. And so Jeff, could you please read out the first question? Yes, Kate. Um, we've received a question from Lindsay. Uh, Lindsay wants to know whether a worker can rely on anything said during a protected conversation to support a whistleblowing claim. Brilliant. Thank you for that, Jeff. And thank you, Lindsay. Um, so if any of you are unaware of what protected conversations are, so they brought in, um, I think, a few years back. Um, so it allows employers to have frank discussions with um, workers if they're looking to depart ways. But protected conversations only operate in limited circumstances. And if they do apply, um, they should not be brought um, in as evidence in future proceedings. But you can't refer to protected conversations in ordinary dismissal claims, but that rule doesn't extend as far as automatically unfair dismissals, um, unless the without prejudice rule applies. So businesses should be um, careful that in whistleblowing cases, there is the risk that anything that is said during protected conversations may be disclosed in future proceedings. Have we got any more questions, Jeff? Yeah, we have, but this one unusually wants to remain anonymous, so I don't have a name. The question is asked, what about good faith? I thought disclosures had to be made in good faith. Yeah, that's a good question, and we haven't touched on that um, during the webinar. Um, and you're right, the pre-June 2013 disclosures had to be made in good faith. But following the Enterprise and Regulatory Reform Act, it removed that requirement, but it didn't remove the requirement completely. So now if a disclosure is made in bad faith, to so say that the um, primary purpose for the worker to bring uh, or to make the whistleblowing claims just because they want to damage their employer's reputation. Tribunals now have the option or discretion to reduce any compensation that's awarded by 25%. But it's, it's important to touch on that point as well in relation to good faith requirements. Um, so there still might be some cases passing through tribunal which have to deal with this good faith requirement. Because remember, the time limit for bringing a whistleblowing claim runs from the date of the dismissal or the detriment not from the time of making the disclosure. So you may have someone that made a disclosure back in 2012 who's not been subjected to a detriment or not been dismissed until perhaps this year, and you know, provided they're able to show that there's a link between the two, they would still be in time. Um, so we still might see some good faith cases coming through. And I think we've got just got enough time for one last question, if there's any more, Jeff. Yeah, we have indeed. And this has come in from David. David has asked, when the Chesterton's appeal is likely to be heard? Yes, so um, unfortunately the Chesterton's case is the all-important case that deals with um, or should be offering some guidance to employers as to how we deal with this public interest requirement and um, the requirement that workers must reasonably believe that the disclosure is in the public interest. Unfortunately, that was listed um, to be heard in the Court of Appeal in October of this year, but they vacated the hearing and um, I don't think last time that I checked that it has been relisted. Um, so hopefully it should be sort of springtime of next year, in which case we still may not receive the judgment until the summertime. I think that's all we have time for today. So apologies if we haven't had time to cover your question. Um, we'll be posting updates on this area on our Employment Buddy blog, so please make sure that you look at these. Um, but all that is left now really is to say thank you very much for listening in.